Welcome to the season two debut of Coexisting with COVID-19. I'm Hanson Hossein, the co-founder of the University of Washington's Communication Leadership Graduate Program and your host. This is the University of Washington's Office of Public Lectures special series that we launched this summer to bring the best of the university's expertise to you, our community. A special thanks to these entities for their support. You're going to put up that slide now. And they're still here supporting us. We'll st we're still here trying to figure out how to coexist with this global pandemic. In this episode, are we there yet? We thought we'd kick off this fall with where we left things this summer. We're wondering where we go from here, as well as how do we get some practical advice from our experts about how to manage this predicament. Happily, Dr. Chris Murray, the director and founder of the University of Washington's Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, has decided to return to our show to help guide us as the IHME continues to produce its highly influential pandemic infection model projections. And we're joined by Dr. Helen Chu, an expert in respiratory viruses from University of Washington Medicine. Thanks to her Seattle flu study, she detected the first American COVID case earlier this year. And if you've got something you'd like to ask our panelists, please feel free to email those questions at any time during this episode to mayiask at uw.edu. And I'll try to incorporate those questions as I'm having this conversation with Helen and with Chris. So with that, Chris, Helen, welcome. Good to be here. Thank you. So Chris, I think we might as well uh, start where we left off a couple of months ago with the projections for the fall. How is the fall looking so far? Well, we're sort of at, as we expected uh, many months ago that there would be a sort of um, mid to late August lull. It's come a little bit later than we expected uh, in Washington, but we're on the downswing in terms of cases. Not surprising uh, given the uh, suggestion of seasonality that, that we see uh, in the data. But now we're entering that phase where we expect transmission to start to pick up again uh, as we roll into October and probably most notably uh, as we go into November and December. And what's going to drive the fall is the confluence of uh, some seasonality that there's sort of everything else being the same. There's going to be more transmission uh, in the winter. And that, you know, lots of people are going back to work. Some a small fraction of kids are going to school, but there's, uh, we see in the data that people are just uh, being less careful. Mask use is down in Washington, down actually below the national average, which is sort of uh, embarrassing for our state. Uh, you know, we're seeing mobility at a higher level than many of the other states in the US. Um, so we're back, not at pre-COVID levels, but we're down 20% from pre-COVID levels, as opposed to, let's say, New York, that's down 30%. So all those things suggest that people are going to progressively be less cautious just at the time where they probably start to need to be more careful as we head into the winter months. And based so on our it doesn't look, yeah, it doesn't, sorry, I, I don't, Go ahead and say that last statement, and I'll ask you a follow-up question. Yeah, you know, it, it, we, we've been saying for a long time, and we see no reason to change the view that we think the winter return will be, you know, substantial and will force us to, you know, go back to reexamine strategies that could be used to, to, to avoid hospitals being overwhelmed. And just br and briefly, based on the, the previous conversation that we did have around the projections that you did have for fall, just to get a better sense of how well these models work, what you're projecting now and what we talked about a couple of months ago, is it pretty much on track and nothing, nothing too surprising right now? So what we do is we look at our own models and the other five P uh, organizations that produce and archive their forecasts on a regular basis. And we look how well we do. And we do this sort of every week to see if we can tune the models to do a better job. And roughly speaking, uh, we at 10 weeks out, we have about an average error of 20%. Now, some places you do a much worse job. We did not see the, the peak in New Delhi, as an example, uh, that, that, that occurred, or the peak in Kenya that's occurred. Uh, but in, in many settings, we do better than 20%. So that's the average falls out at about 20% error. 
and that's a little bit better than the other models that are out there. Uh, there's three or four that are about 30% at 10 weeks. So, uh, you know, I think collectively as a community, the, the modeling or, or some of the models are, are pretty decent. And so there's, they're a useful guide for thinking about what's to come. Great. Helen, you've been on the ground and in the community with this crisis from the beginning. Um, and you heard Chris reference the current model and projections and that back to school is going to fuel some of that. What's your thinking currently about back to school, given that this is now happening with us? Yeah, I mean, I would, that's a great question. I would agree that we are in a place now where community transmission is too high to safely return to school, that we really need to be at levels that are low enough where there is still risk, but the risk is low enough that the number of cases that you would detect, you would be able to rapidly um, identify and control quickly. And we simply are not there yet. And as people return back to work and as colleges go back into session and as other things move forward, restaurants and bars and all of these other things, we are moving ourselves further and further away from the goal of getting our children an education. There's a there's a lot of pressure from parents, from politicians, um, from the econ from people who are worried about the economy that believe that we need to get into school sooner than later, despite the risk. And when you think about this, and you as a medical practitioner about that balance between risk and the true medical reality, how do we navigate this even on a personal level? Right. I mean, I feel like there's discordance between what we want and what we are willing to do to achieve it. Um, and there's quite a disconnect. What we should be doing is to prioritize the education of our children and to do whatever it takes to make sure that we can open in-person school for the youngest, um, for those who are most likely to benefit and the most likely to be hurt from the closures of schools. And we, as a society, have not made that decision uh, I, I, and that's that's very upsetting to me as a parent, um, and I think it's very upsetting to me as, as a physician. I think what we know about transmission um, in children is there's more and more data to show that children do have do carry virus, that they are able to transmit virus, but there's still not a lot of good data about what happens when you have an adult and a child together and who transmits to who and how much children play a role in sort of... Um, both seeding and spreading um, an outbreak. Because for flu, we know that children are often the source of outbreaks. And schools, when you close schools, um, you shut down transmission of flu. And that's been demonstrated both with seasonal flu and with pandemic flu. With coronavirus, the role of children is not as well defined yet. We don't have enough data to definitively say that, that children play a major role in, in seeding and spreading outbreaks. I have to ask this as one brief follow-up question, Helen, based on this thread, is that we have seen some schools in other parts of the country open up, mm -hmm. and there have been uh, indications of infection, especially among some teachers. Is that, is that telling enough that, that, that we should be paying attention to that in this part of the world, or is that just an anecdotal situation? No, we should definitely be paying attention to that. The children are not, so the, the, um, the risk to children is much, much lower than the risk to adults. That's, that's pretty clear now that uh, there is this multi-system inflammatory syndrome that arises, but it's pretty rare. But the risk to adults, especially as they get older and older, and a lot of the teachers are 60 years and up, the risk is substantial. So I think we have to get to the point where we can open schools responsibly for the sake of the teachers and the children. All right. Um, Chris, as we're having this conversation, there is a, uh, I, I sense both a little bit of frustration and concern in both of what you're saying that we're still having to manage a pandemic that doesn't seem to be going away as quickly as we thought. Something that struck me about your most recent model that you shared was that your headline was a little different. Rather than talking about number of deaths right at the top, it was really, you, you mentioned number of lives saved as a headline. Was that a very um, deliberate approach to communicating differently to get people to think and act differently in the current situation? Or is there something else that you're trying to communicate right now? You know, I think that uh, people think that, uh, or some people think that the most important part of uh, projecting what's gonna happen is about the biology of, of the virus. And it, it, it's not, actually. I mean, it's certainly important, 
what matters is, and we've seen this now time and time again, playing out in places like Florida or Israel or Serbia, uh, is human behavior, where uh, you know people uh, become more or less vigilant, and unfortunately, they become more or less vigilant exactly in tune to the rate. So we get a roller coaster. Like when things get better, they become less vigilant. That makes transmission go back up. When things get bad, like it, they really got in, in you know, late July in Florida, people become more careful, peaks the epidemic, brings it down. And so we're in this sort of roller coaster cycle. There have been some really exaggerated roller coasters that have occurred around the world. Uh, and then the other factor there is governments sort of uh, helping or facilitating or communicating to the public to change behavior, either through mandates or through pu public, you know, communication, or there are leaders being very clear and consistent about uh, the importance of wearing a mask and, and avoiding contact. Uh, and so we've been trying, uh, particularly lately, to emphasize the potential around mask wearing as a strategy where we think from the systematic reviews we've done that both at the individual level and at the population level, pretty pretty convincing evidence, uh, and it has no effect on the economy, uh, or almost no effect on the economy. And so if you're worried about the economy, um, this is a strategy that's really not going to stop people being able to, to work. And so we've really tried to emphasize that, emphasize that in other countries as well as here in the US. How, how surprised are you that mask wearing remains a controversy and a, a sticking point, I, not even just, just in this country, but I've seen it happen in other countries as well, even in Canada. Um, and then we saw that uh, motorcycle uh, rally in Sturgis, South Dakota, where a lot of people were encouraged by the government not to wear masks, and they're now looking at that as, a, as an infection spread, a super spreading event there. So why is this remaining a, a challenge for us? You know, it's really interesting because uh, if you look around the world, uh, mask wearing in some places has become quite controversial. It's not just in the U.S. You know, like Northern Europe, uh, you know, Sweden and Norway and Finland, Netherlands, there's extraordinary resistance, Denmark, to mask wearing. They have some of the lowest rates in the world. Uh, U.K., it's become an issue about individual, you know, rights. Uh, and then in other parts of the world, you know, look at the rates almost approaching 90% in many parts of Latin America, over 90% in Singapore and Taiwan, Hong Kong. So, you know, it, it really depends where. And interestingly, it's not left and right, because in some other countries, it's sort of reversed. The, the left is the anti-mask crowd, and the right is pro-mask. So it, it taps into some um, emotional uh, part that, that's sort of hard to understand quite why people are so passionate about it. That's interesting. So I know that even during the, the 1919, 1918 influenza, there was controversy around masks. So it seems to be something with our human psyche and maybe hiding our face. It's really interesting. Um, yeah. I wonder if there's a tipping point, you know, in, in society where you get to a certain number of people who are wearing masks, um, where it hits, it hits a point where you feel like you should wear a mask to fit in. And I feel like we, um, we look at East Asia, and that's certainly the case. And in the US, certainly when it became pretty common for people to start wearing masks, I think more people were willing to do so. Well, that's interesting, Helen, because I know that uh, here at the University of Washington campus, and you've seen them as well over the last few years, you notice that there are students who've been wearing masks even before this pandemic, but they mm -hmm. tend to, at least it looks like, to be international students who have lived through versions of a pandemic and know better. And so there, that was socially acceptable, despite it's not being acceptable here, but we're going that way. So it's interesting. We're actually next episode, we're going to be talking about risk. And one of our experts is saying that we should be thinking differently about how we communicate and incentivize around masks and not shame people into it. But you're suggesting there is some kind of popular trend or push that does incentivize people to do this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it, it, as you've engaged with public uh, health uh, officials for, for a while now, Helen, and, um, and you heard Chris talk about the, the diversity of reaction by leaders around the world and as well a mask wearing culture, what, what do you think we need to do from a public health communication point of view to, to really get people to not, I don't want to say toe the line, but to at least respect the ferocity of this pandemic and try to bring down some of those numbers? I think a lot of what's lacking in the U.S. is a clear, consistent message.
from a trusted public health official um, in terms of things like a daily briefing of this is what's happened, um, this is what's going to happen next. Um, this has come up specifically with the vaccines a lot. Um, and we as a society tend to, I think, mistrust science more than some other societies. Um, and I th think that part of the reason why there's so much mistrust about the potential vaccine that's, that may or may not arrive this, this winter um, is because of this conflation of politics and, and science and public health. So I would really like it if we had um, clear, deliberate messaging from a trusted public health, health official who is apolitical. And I think what? that would help a lot. Uh, what explains our resistance to that? We're seeing, I mean, I, I've seen the Canadian public health officials speak, it seems to be with one voice in a trusted way. You see it happening in Europe to a certain extent, certainly in New Zealand and in Australia. Is it, is, it, is it part of our political culture or what else is going on here? Yeah, I think it's part of our individuality. And, and <laughs> I mean, it, it helps us and it hurts us, right? <laughs> and in this situation, it doesn't help us. I mean, I think that the anti-vax um, and movement and the distrust of science has been around for a while. This will likely exacerbate that um, in many, many ways. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know how to fix it, um, but it, it seems like we are going to get to a situation very soon where we're going to hit a point where we have to make decisions about things like vaccines, and it'll be very difficult to have consistent public messaging. Interesting. Well, Chris, I know that your models for months have been referred to very directly by the White House in their briefings. and. Um, uh, uh, even the most recent ones, and sometimes distorted a little bit as well. What has been your experience in terms of getting the attention of public health officials, especially here in this country, and what else would you like to see them do? You know, I think uh, this has been a time, in fact, of unprecedented attention from, uh, you know, political leaders of, in this country on both end of the political spectrum uh, globally. So, you know, I, I've never seen a time when uh, there's as much sort of outreach to uh, scientists, to ourselves, as in the past where you sort of had to push results into the public sphere to get uh, attention. People are, are looking for solutions. You know, what we're hearing right now is that it's politically from, from all sides of the spectrum, sort of globally, it's the same narrative it's not going to be feasible to go into prolonged full lockdown just from the point of view of, of countries, states, economies. And so there's this incredible interest in what else can they do? And, you know, constant outreach about tell us options. Is it enough to, you know, uh, close bars and restaurants and theaters and ban indoor gatherings? Will that be enough? Uh, will it be enough? And if, if things get really bad, can we lock down for a very short period, two weeks, three weeks? And will that be enough to take the pressure off? Um, so I, I've, you know, it's been interesting how much uh, receptivity there is from everyone. Now, in the public sphere, what people say, because there's, you know, there's elections underway, gets is a little, sometimes a little bit different than what they may be discussing uh, behind closed doors, on both sides of the, of the spectrum. And, and you know, we talk to uh, leaders in, in on both sides uh, quite regularly, and there's, you know, real interest. I think right now we're seeing uh, a collective desire for a winter surge to not be true. And so you're getting this sort of narrative that, oh, it can't possibly be that bad this winter. And, you know, I think that's a, that, that's a bit of a worry because I think it'll lead us to roll into November and some people will be surprised when things start to get worse again. Well, Helen, based on what Chris was saying, there seems to be some either wishful thinking or magical thinking going on. I mean, from uh, it looks like the new health advisor to President Trump, uh, Dr. Scott Atlas, sort of thinking about herd immunity and even some conversation in some circles about actually wearing a mask increases our immunity because it's not, they're imperfect, so it lets in a little bit, but not enough to incapacitate us. What's your thinking right now about um, how we manage this based on what we are hearing, the diversity of voices around what needs to happen from a public health point of view? 
Yeah, I'm, I think th it is a lot of information that's coming at us from a lot of different places and what you believe and what you believe is, it, it's hard to disentangle all of it. I mean, I think th the main thing about the herd immunity issue, I think is, is simply that it's, it's not going to work, that we would create too many, um, too many fatalities with that approach. Um, and so that's, that's not what we want to do. What we want to do is to, to take the measures that are known to work, like masking and social distancing, and then apply those um, consistently until we get to the point of a vaccine um, of much greater availability of a vaccine beyond just um, the initial rollout to sort of high-risk populations. Well, you've referenced the vaccine a couple of times now in this conversation. What is your, I hesitate to ask you this, your best guess about when we're going to get a vaccine or what that vaccine is going to look like or what the rollout is going to look like? Uh, is this question for me? Or for yeah, Chris? yeah. <laughs> so, um, so there's a couple of vaccines that are currently in phase three, and there are many, many, many more coming down the pipeline. The ones that are furthest along are based on platforms that have never been used before in humans, um, have never been successfully licensed for use in humans. And so they're, they're, they're riskier platforms, but they're also um, in many ways easier to produce um, and faster to, to, um, to the scale that we need for vaccinating the entire population. And I think that, you know, they look good. They look good in the early trials. The immunogenicity data looks good. Um, but with every vaccine, there's just a high risk of not succeeding. I think what we're hoping um, in sort of in, in our group and in all the others who, who work on these vaccine trials is that these are done safely and rigorously and we'd be allowed to take the time to, to do them that way. And I, we are doing that, um, but I, I am worried about sort of the, the messaging that's coming out from political leadership. Yeah, uh, Chris, I have I probably referred to you a little bit on some of that messaging. There seems to be a, a desire to see a vaccine in time for the election in November, although they're saying there's no correlation between the two. And I've even seen Bill Gates say that he believes there will be definitely a vaccine in place by the end of next year. So how much as you're considering your next set of models, are you willing to take into account some sort of vaccine as you're thinking about projections? Well, we're, we're um, creating the capability within the modeling framework to uh, run scenarios around vaccines. There's a lot of interest about, uh, even before we have a vaccine, anticipating the question about what is fair distribution of a vaccine across countries in a, in a world where there will be much greater need than availability. And so, you know, for that reason alone, we're, we're exploring, uh, uh, you know, what might be um, the impact of a vaccine. And if you think about it, you know, masks uh, are pretty analogous, right? Because masks have about a 30 to 40% reduction in transmission. So, and if you have everybody wearing a mask, that can be enough to bring a place where this famous number R, the number of infections caused by a single infection, you know, can be 1.2, which can lead to a big epidemic taking off, bring it down to 0.9, and then it goes away. So likewise, even a vaccine that doesn't work tremendously well, let's say 50%, given to 60% of the people, is going to have about the same effect as masks. You put those two together, you can have a pretty huge effect. But so we are we're, we're definitely mo building that into our modeling framework. We won't build it into our public uh, scenarios, our, our most likely scenario, until we're convinced that A, there's a licensed vaccine and B, that there'll be sufficient production to actually you know, have a meaningful impact on community transmission. Yeah, that, that's it. Uh, and so we will definitely build it in. It may be that new treatments come sooner, uh, given some of the early, you know, investigations that we're hearing about. Uh, and so, and but again, even then, there will be a shortage of doses, uh, even if we see much more successful treatments uh, come available. Yeah, but for now, I think your point is well taken that until we have the reality of a vaccine, the mask is something you can take into account, especially if mask use just goes up, you can see the numbers change accordingly in the models. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for that. So, so Helen, um, th we have a very specific question uh, uh, from a, a health point of view. Um, 
my wife suggested we get our flu shots early this year. Good idea? That's, uh, <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so we're not seeing much flu in the Southern Hemisphere. There's been uh, a lot of social distancing and a lot of good use of masks and a uh, good, strong, consistent national policy in the Southern Hemisphere. And that's been driving, I think, decreased transmission of many, many respiratory viruses. It's not the case here in the United States. We're not doing as good of a job as Australia and New Zealand. It's a little bit less predictable what's going to happen with flu. That being said, I can tell you that in our surveillance platforms that we currently have in place, we are starting to see flu in the community here in Seattle. Um, and so the idea of getting a flu vaccine is really important. And then the question is timing. When do you want to get your flu vaccine? Um, so flu vaccines, after you get them, last about six months. So you really want to optimize it for when you are most likely to um, start seeing flu go up in the community. But flu is unpredictable. I usually say October. October is when you want to get your flu vaccine. But I know it's available now. And some people got it in August. And if you got it in August, it's OK. But I, I generally would like people to get it in October because here in Seattle, we tend to see it in December, January. Well, that's interesting because that's it seems to be a lot of emphasis right now for us to get our, our shots, especially as, as some are returning to school now. But you're, that whole idea of it being more effective over six months that we should time it out is, is interesting to me. Um, just one more question about the vaccine situation. Given that there is a strong resistance to actually taking vaccines among a small a subset of people in this country and elsewhere, how important is it when we do get a vaccine how important is it that it has to be 100% effective for it to get as widespread adoption as possible? Are you concerned about actually people resisting the taking of that vaccine because they're concerned that it hasn't been tested sufficiently? Because there seems to be a lot of wishful thinking around that as well. Yeah, I think, well, so the number of people who need to get a vaccine is, is inversely proportional to the R. So the trans, the, how, how likely one person is, is going to spread that infection to another person. So for measles, for example, where it's very, very infectious and one person can infect 20 other people, then a lot of people need to get the vaccine to suppress transmission in the community. For SARS-CoV, the R is not as high as measles, but it's higher than flu. So more people then would need to get a flu vaccine will need to get the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Okay. Chris, I'm curious, I know you've been starting to do projections in other parts of the world as well. I'm wondering what we can learn about, it seems to me that there have been some reductions, but there also have been some flare-ups, and there's obviously some places where things have almost gotten out of hand, such as India and Brazil. Um, what can we learn? And then Spain has seen a flare-up as well. So what can we learn about that as you're thinking about your projections, that, that even as these numbers go down, they can always come back up again? Um, how do you take all that into account, looking specifically at places like India? Well, India is really interesting. I mean, first of all, uh, unfortunately, really big epidemic. Uh, it, uh, and the contrast between India and Pakistan is just super interesting because they both... Uh, the virus showed up in both countries about the same time. Uh, there was never a very large epidemic in Pakistan, and what epidemic there was peaked unexpectedly and started coming down. And nobody in Pakistan, in the scientific community or the government or externally, has a great explanation other than uh, background immunity to coronaviruses. And this has become one of the big debates. Like. The reason we're not seeing an epidemic in Africa, is it because uh, there is background immunity uh, because of exposure perhaps to other coronaviruses? Uh, you know, recent paper out about Kenya arguing that they've, they've hit herd immunity, it, not because, uh, because of the combination of, you know, half the population being resistant to start with, and then quite a lot of transmission and, and it's peaked and it's, it's basically over. That, that's their argument. Uh, so if you look at the contrast between India and Pakistan, you know, India hasn't seen that peak. New Delhi did, uh, but the rest of India, we're still seeing these epidemics steadily growing and they're moving into the poor and very high population states like Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. Uh, so we unfortunately think there's going to be a very large death toll in India, maybe as high as you know, 650,000 deaths by the end of the year. And I think India is a classic example of a country that does not feel like they can 
afford economically a, another major lockdown. So they're trying to figure out what they can do to manage this, you know, uh, unfolding epidemic. And, you know, there's all these mystery things like, you know, what's happened in Pakistan and Kenya, what, what's happened in some other parts of Central America, where suddenly you get a peak and we can't explain it. So I think that there's, there's a lot we don't know about uh, some of the transmission dynamics, and that's making it harder for policymakers who are sort of like hoping we're going to be like Pakistan if you're in India. Uh, in terms of hitting a peak suddenly, um, that, that's, that's making it a more challenging environment to come up with a mid to long term strategy. That's, that's quite amazing. I mean, Helen, as I'm listening to Chris speak about this, it makes me think that nine months in, at least here in the United States, we seem to have learned a, a lot about the pandemic, but we seem to know so little still. The fact that there could be that distinction between Pakistan and India and not understanding why yet. Why is it? Why, why do we have so much uncertainty still around this? I or, don't or, know. or how much That's are you? I mean, you, you, you did the Seattle flu study, right? And, yes. and you've been learning yeah. about this for a long time. You came across the first case. It seems to be a very elusive target still in terms of trying to nail down what is actually going on. Why is that the case? Is that is that the case with all viruses, or is there something very specific about the coronavirus that is is making it harder? I don't know. I don't know why this virus is so tricky. It, it is not behaving like the other respiratory viruses. It doesn't behave like flu. It doesn't behave like RSV. And those are the most common things we think about. And it doesn't even act like human coronavirus. Um, I think that certainly it shares a lot of things in common with the other viruses that, um, you know, droplets, aerosols, um, person to person, uh, some some components of, of just the, the targets on the surface that you would aim for with a vaccine. Those things, I think we, we use the data from the human coronaviruses and from some of the other respiratory viruses to, to be able to uh, accelerate a lot of uh, the findings or uh, accelerate a lot of the research towards the findings. But yeah, I, I, I am surprised again and again by this virus. You know, at first we thought, and I was convinced that there was just no disease in children, which was shocking to me because it would be the only respiratory virus where children are not part of this chain of transmission. And now we know that it actually is like the other viruses. Children do carry the virus. They have high viral loads. Um, They're just not as symptomatic as adults. Um, so I think we, this is a very, very intensely studied virus. I'm sure we're going to find out more and more over time. Um, but yes, it is not behaving as, as we predicted. Well, I'm curious, when you came across that first case as you were doing the Seattle flu study earlier this year, how, how quick were you to be able to identify what it truly was? Yeah, so that work was really done by Leah Starita and Trevor Bedford, who are my co-investigators on the flu study. And... You know, back in the day when we started seeing those cases come out of Wuhan, um, and Leah very quickly was able to sort of figure out how to develop um, a, a rapid t test to identify the virus. And and once she was able to do that, then then she ran that test, and then we were able to identify it very quickly. That we also then took that sample and moved it on to um, whole genome sequencing, which is basically. Um, looking at the genetic characteristics of the entire virus. And, and by the next day, we were able to confirm that it was, in fact, SARS-CoV. Hmm. So uh, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, subtle, so. Yeah. Chris, I'm, th I'm curious, as we look at your models and how you've been uh, evolving with how you communicate them, how you headline them, uh, and as we as a society seem to get more and more immune to the idea that, yeah, people are going to die and we seem to be okay with that to a certain degree, is there an opportunity to change a little bit of the, um, the, the verbiage around this? I mean, because there's clear, especially when we're talking about young people, as, as Helen's referring, that there are serious cardiovascular impacts, whether or not you're going to die from this. How, how can you incorporate, say, infection rate or hospitalizations into your model, or do you have to continue using the death rate as your primary metric? So uh, currently what we do to sort of um, reconstruct the past in terms of transmission and the model is we, we actually do use case data. We use where, where states report it, hospital admission data. Unfortunately, not all states do. The federal government doesn't as well, which although they have the data, we know that the hospitals are required to report, but the government chooses not to share that data. 
and then we use death data. Uh, and you know, I think our instinct back in the spring that uh, you have to be very careful in interpreting trends and case rates. You know, what happened in Florida is a very clear demonstration that that was true, which is when you hugely scale up testing, you, uh, you know, you make the trend up, which is a real trend up, look dramatically worse. And the reason we know that is if you, you take hospitalizations in Florida and compare them to the trend in cases, cases went up tenfold in a, in a two-week period and hospitalizations went up a twofold in, in that period. And, and we trust more hospitalizations and deaths. But we try to use them all. Uh, and it's, it, the, I think what's become sort of interesting is this whole debate about what are the indicators that people should use to sort of diagnose where we are right now. And you know, some uh, cities, some counties, some states are using other indicators as well. So for example, there's one which is the test positivity rate. Um, and you know, WHO, the World Health Organization, came out in May and said, you know, one of the best markers of what's happening to the epidemic is a test positivity rate below 5%, you have it under control. Well, uh, unfortunately, this turns out to be not true because, they're, because of uh, the, t you know, the positivity rate really depends who you test, how much you test. Uh, it turns out it's it's almost uncorrelated. It's very low correlation with anything else on COVID, like case rates or death rates. So I think we're you know it's back to what you said before. We're still learning. We're still learning this far in, even what is a good indicator at the community level, uh, above and beyond the obvious ones like cases and deaths uh, of the trend. And you know I'm hopeful that we will you know speed up the learning process so that as we roll into the winter, we're in a, in a better position to sort of help schools and counties and cities and states uh, make choices that, that will actually become quite difficult. That's really uh, important insight. I was actually going to ask you a closing question before we closed with Helen about your projections for 2021, but we just got a question from the audience that was specifically addressed to you, so I'll try it out with you, Chris. You mentioned that there's less COVID-19 in Africa than anticipated until now. How much of this is related to limited testing in Sub-Saharan Africa? Um, are excess deaths higher in Sub-Saharan Africa or consistent with the idea that there's less COVID-19 transmission than expected? You know, I think we've all been expecting, you know, month after month that uh, there's going to be a, a much bigger outbreak in many parts of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. There was a big outbreak in South Africa but we've been expecting it to show up. I think we've been going down the tick list of what might explain, you know, lack of testing, um, you know, uh, other possibilities about transmission dynamics, uh, background immunity. But uh, even though we know that there's under uh, registration of cases and deaths, we're not seeing hospitals being overwhelmed. So that we, we know there aren't epidemics like in India or Latin America or what we had in, in New York. So that extreme is not occurring. And now there are some zero prevalence studies mm -hmm. that suggest that there's actually quite high cumulative infection already. And the other thing that we've learned in the last two or three months is that the you know, the infection fatality rate, the number of infections per death, if you reverse it around, so infections per death, is as high as, you know, 10,000 or 20,000 in the youngest age groups. And if you are in a place with a very young population age structure, you can actually get a lot of cumulative infection and not observe that much death. So the, the young age structure is, is turning out to be even more protective than we expected. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it could well be that things are worse than we're perceiving, but they're not at that level of that the sort of overwhelming epidemics that we're seeing elsewhere. Got it. Well, thanks for answering that question. Helen, as we begin to close out our time together, you have been on the front lines of this from the beginning. You, your work is very much centered in the community. Uh, as we continue to try to coexist with this thing, and your work is as vital as it has ever been, how might it change as you move forward over the next few months, even the next year, um, so that you can continue to be as relevant as you have been so far? Yeah, I mean, we are working on a lot of different studies, all community-based. Um, and I think one of the, the main, um, I guess the theme of what we're doing is, is, is what happens with reopening. 
in fact. Um, so it's, it's, we would like to know what's happening in the public schools with reopening. We'd like to know what's going on in the undergraduate campus with reopening. And we want to develop strategies to be used in these populations to be able to identify early and to control outbreaks. So that's work that I've been focused on for mu much of the summer and, and we're hoping to launch very soon. And then the other work that we're continuing to do are smaller scale studies in the homeless population here in Seattle. We've been doing um, studies for the last two years and are continuing to do surveillance in, in these populations to also to uh, identify hotspots early and then to rapidly test the entire shelter and to control outbreaks. And that seems to be a strategy that, that is working. Um, and then the other work that we would also do is to understand what is going on in families with young children. A lot of what um, I have been working on is how do you conduct a study or how do you understand um, what is going on without, uh, without having to interact with the individual? Because in a pandemic, you can't just go to someone's house and draw their blood. So we've been working on lots of things, you know, uh, things like swabbing yourself for flu and for coronavirus and um, monitoring things at home using devices and uh, monitoring your breathing rate to see if you can predict if you're going to have coronavirus and then uh, developing other methods to, to detect things early in, at home so that you don't have to go to uh, a clinic or a hospital and risk exposing others. So that's, that's the goal, is that we, we are able to develop strategies, both on a community level and on a very local level, to, to uh, diagnose early and to stop the spread of the virus. Yeah, that's really profound and obviously very powerful and timely work. I, I do have one final specific question that we received that maybe uh, we'll look forward to the to next year now. Do you think we'll be returning to in-person classes, I guess as a university student has asked this, for winter or spring quarter? So in 2021, what do you think it looks like? Um, I think it depends on the vaccine. So I, I do think it depends on that. Um, if we are able to get to suppress community transmission to a low enough rate, we may be able to open in-person classes um, for the youngest children. I think that that would be the priority. And even then it'll probably be a hybrid where they come in some days and stay home some days. And then if that works, it would be iterative. Then you bring in the older children, then after that, the older children and then and so forth. But I think we need to keep really focused on what's most important, which is that very young children cannot learn at home and that distance learning really, um, really hurts the disadvantaged the most. Um, so I, I, I feel like as a community, I would like to see us get to the point where we, we understand that and we prioritize that. That's great. A similar question for you, Chris, as we close based on the models and projections, what can you tell us for 2021? You know, we get asked that a lot, and uh, our take on the models, uh, and, and I think the, 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 the big question mark that affects the long-term view is what is the level of um, cumulative infection where you'll get herd immunity? Because it's not just a function of, um, you know, the very naive, simple models of, you know, uh, calculation from R. I think there's all these ideas now about super spreaders and heterogeneity of susceptibility and some background resistance. So I, I'd say there's more of a view that we will see herd immunity kick in at you know somewhere in the 50, 60 percent range, could be lower. Um, and if that's the case, then we might well be, if the winter is as bad as we expect, uh, we may be to the point come May or June where even without a vaccine being widely used, uh, we may be through most of the transmission. There could, could still be a third wave next winter, I mean, 2021 winter. Uh, but I sort of, if you look at our models, I think we're seeing in many parts of the world, June starts to look a whole lot better. Uh, now, could be worse than that, but it, uh, and uh, an early vaccine could also move that date earlier when we start to get some semblance of normality. Well, maybe it's magical thinking on my part, but I'd like to end on that 
potentially hopeful note, despite the fact that we might have some more pain to go through over the next few months. So Dr. Chris Murray and Dr. Helen Chu, thank you so much for sharing your incredible insights. And thank you both for your really powerful, useful, impactful research and for joining us this evening. And for all of you for joining us today and join us again next week uh, for our next episode in coexisting with COVID-19, which will look very specifically at COVID-19 and risk with three phenomenal University of Washington experts. You can register for that right now at events.ew.edu slash 2021 lectures. And you can learn more about the series at uw.edu lectures and find previous episodes, including this one and previous last season at bit.ly coexist archive. Really appreciate you being with us this evening. I look forward to seeing you next episode. I'm Hanson Hossein. Have a great evening.